to further work in terms of how we'll be looking to refresh this scheme going forward to make it even more relevant for the future. So if I can endorse uh, the report and move the recommendations in paragraph 2.1 of uh, the report. Excellent. Moving on then, uh, we've now got some public question time and we'll have a number of questions. And can I invite uh, Ms. Pamela Hanson to come and ask her first couple of questions? this on to Ariba because they're the operators of the service because this is a service they operate commercially it's not one that we control and very much hot off the press uh, we've had a, a response uh, from them and I'll make sure that we get you this uh, as a detailed response in writing but sort of very simplistically they're very keen to sort of point out it wasn't a fire it was a breakdown but nothing was on on fire so I think that's an important point to make um, they say that um, it took um, quite a bit of time because the driver had to contact the depot to get a replacement vehicle. Um, they are investigating the reasons as to why uh, the other vehicle didn't stop and they'll be coming back with the, the details of that investigation as well. So that's the response we, we've had from them. Obviously, uh, it's, it's not a sort of good state of affairs that passengers had such a difficult journey on that day in question. And then I think we've got a following question from you as well. I believe that a rural car could only be charged up within the Merseyside zone. But when I boarded the X1 in Greenway Road, Runcorn, I saw a lady pay from the Rural's car on this bus. And she and the driver said that this was all right. I have had other discussions with people who believe that they can use it outside the Merseyside zone. Apparently, there are tickets that you can get, that you can use, but this causes confusion between the drivers and passengers. Could it not be made clearer when the tickets can be used to save confusion between the drivers and passengers? Yeah, and, and thanks for your questions. Uh, very good points raised, and again, we'll get you a detailed response in writing. Uh, because one of the things we want to do is simplify ticketing to make it much easier for people to, to use. Um, as part of our response, we will get you the, the detailed answer to the validity of each of the tickets, uh, but I think that probably highlights your point about we need to, to simplify it more. Uh, in terms of the specifics, obviously we work with PayPoint, and that's one of the ways that you can charge up um, Walrus cards at a variety of PayPoint locations. Uh, not just within the city region, there are a handful outside the bounds of the city region as well. But also, the um, card itself does have the ability for products to be topped up on the electric card on some of the buses that Arriba Stagecoach uh, have 
in the, the city region as well. So we'll get to that as a full detailed response, but, but thanks for the question. Thank you. Okay. And next we've got Mr. Wendell has got a couple of questions for us. And is it, do you want to interject at this point? Okay. It's just that the lady was quite clear that there was a fire. And simply because a reader sent us a message saying there wasn't a fire doesn't mean there wasn't a fire. I'm just intrigued. Uh, was, did the lady think there was a fire because she saw the fire or did the driver tell her there was a fire? It's, it's such a dramatic thing for a reader to say, in effect, you're talking nonsense, there wasn't a fire. And I'm, I'm deliberately uh, overemphasizing you saying that. No, no, that's fine. And just to return to the point, what they said is that it was a, a catastrophic failure of the engine and this may have resulted in hot oil or fumes being visible. That's what they said. So we can obviously sort of probe that further. Absolutely, but, um, but that's the... Yeah? No, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Wang. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Right. So my question one is, on the route 35 and 35 e towards Eccleston in West Park in St Helens, there is a bus stop on Nosley Road, just before Rivington Road, but the 35 and 35 e doesn't stop there. Even though I'm the bus stop, it says it does. So, um, yeah, so what happens is it, it stops just after it turns into Rivington Road. And um, now according to the Google Maps, there, there, is a, there is a bus stop. But actually, if you look at Street View on Google Maps, there's no bus stop on that side of the road going towards Eccleston. Um, but on the other side, on the, on the side going towards St Helens, it has a bus stop and bus times here. So it says at one point, it says this is the, the this is bus times going towards Eccleston and, you, and the bus will stop on the opposite side of the road. So what the question I'm asking is why doesn't the bus actually stop at the bus stop stated in those roads before it turns right to, into Rivington Road? And why and why is there no bus stop recognised in Rivington Road to show that there's actually a bus stop there? Okay. Again, very good detailed question that we'll get you the detailed answer in writing to in, in the next ten days. Uh, what I'm, I'm told from our, our team is that actually on Rivington Road towards Eccleston there isn't the physical space for a bus stop because of things like trees and insufficient road space to deal with it. But the bus is meant to operate at a, as a hail and ride uh, on that stretch of road. So anywhere on that road that's suitable, you should be able to stop the bus. If that's not happening, then obviously we need to make sure we're fully aware of that and, and manage it through with the reader accordingly. Because if it's meant to be a hail and ride that people can get on and off, we need that to be operated properly. We also need to make sure that it's communicated properly so people know it's hail and ride and don't kind of think, well, there's no bus stop, so I can't use the bus. Okay. And you've got a second question as well. Yeah. Okay, second question. It's about the Mersey travel concession cards. So if you were apply for the OAP pass for, for Mersey Travel, you can take your completed form and your evidence to any Mersey Travel shop and they will literally make up the pass for you there and then. And you can actually walk out with your pass and use it straight away. Now, if you were to, to apply for the disabled pass, you have to take in your form and evidence, but they tell you you have to send it, some, send it away somewhere and it will be sent to you in the post. Now, allegedly, a lot of people who have got the OAP pass, a percentage of them, also can drive and have a car. Whereas obviously, people with a table pass, like myself, are unable to drive, and we actually need to use the pass on, on the public transport system to access the community. So why, so why have we, we been told we have to wait for our pass and they can get there straight away? If they, why can't the disabled pass be made up in the shop at the same, at the same as the OAPs? Or if it can't be done, what, why, why don't they make the OAPs wait there so at least it's in, in accordance to the same ratio as the disabled pass? Yeah, again, very good um, practical question, highlighting um, differences in, in the way that you can apply for those passes. 
Again, we will get you a detailed response within the 10 days. Simply, it's because the um, application processes are different, because the qualifying criteria uh, are different, particularly around the disabled passes. There are occasions where that needs a medical referral, and obviously that needs to be done um, away from a hub. That's not something that could be carried out in those locations. So that's the key reason why the application processes are different between the different types of passes. Okay, thanks for your help. Thank you. And the final question we've got this afternoon is from Mr. Grace. At the end of the Transport Committee on the 4th of April 2019, uh, Councillor Gordon Freeman, who yeah, is here, uh, announced that the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority had been successful in its bid for £7.5 million pounds of access for all funding from the government to improve disabled access of various train stations, which were <coughs> Beggar Park, Broad Green Hillside, St Michael's and Hunts Cross stations. The Liverpool City Region Combined Authority also decided at its meeting on the 28th of June 2019 to contribute £7.5 million pounds of its own funds towards the project from the Strategic Investment Fund. Therefore, as the budget has been already agreed, could you please give timescales or indicative timescales as to when the LCRCA expects that works to improve disabled access at each of those five stations that I mentioned earlier in the question will be completed? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. And obviously, we'll get you a detailed response in writing within 10 days. But um, Simply, uh, we've entered into the agreements we have to with both Northern for Broad Green but also Mersey Rail for Hunter Cross, St Michael's, Birkenhead North and High Town because they're the station operators um, in order to press forward with that. We are hoping that the outline des design for the works will be complete by April next year as part of the kind of uh, the initial stages of it. Then what would follow beyond April is the awarding of, of contracts for detailed design and construction with um, construction uh, companies and that we would hope that all the kind of works would be complete between April 2021 and October 2021. So those are the timescales we're looking at for the full delivery of those schemes. Excellent. Okay, we don't, for item now, we don't have any petitions or statements. Item 10, we don't have any urgent uh, business. So that concludes the formal meeting. Uh, as members will be aware, we've actually got a private member briefing session uh, at the rising of this uh, committee. Now I was going to suggest that we reconvene at 25 to in case anyone needs a comfort break because they will then have a half an hour.